Hits a ball out. Eighth inning, 10-3. Bases are loaded for Verlander, who waits out a three-hole pitch. He swings, and it's a high fly ball. Deep center field. It is gone. Home run. And a huge bat flip to celebrate. All right, Ben, start the show already. What is up, everybody? Welcome into another episode of Flippin' Bats. I'm your host, Ben Verlander. We got a lot to discuss this week. We're going to hit some storylines. We're going to get into this week's Twitter poll. And, of course, our interview. I have guest Shane Green of the Atlanta Braves with me. Then we'll get into this week in Otani News, my favorite segment of all time. Of course, the six-tool player of the week, and it is the beginning of the month. So we'll talk about the power rankings, uh, the top five power rankings throughout the league. But let's get into some storylines. This week was a big week in baseball. The All-Star teams were announced, uh, which is a big deal. Everybody voted. It was a little weird this year with the voting. Uh, you had two different rounds of voting. You had the first round and then the finalists advanced, and then you had to vote again for those guys. But alas, we are all done with the voting and the teams have been announced. So look, let's take a look at the American League and obviously the best player in the planet, Mike Trout, is hurt. He got voted in as a center fielder, so he will not be playing the game. But, but look, a lot of these guys are such good stories. Teoscar Hernandez is one of the best stories uh, in all of baseball, and to make the all-star team as a starter, so cool. Uh, but look, this team, I, I, feel like the, I feel like the American League is pretty good. Um, I think I'm hopeful Cedric Mullins steps in in center field for Mike Trout. Uh, I, I feel like he deserved to be a starter, and since Trout will be out, I think Mullins will step in there. But look, I mean, we all know I love Shohei Otani. For him to be the starting DH is awesome. Uh, Vladimir Guerrero Jr., this, we, we nailed the American League. This was good here. Uh, so I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the reserves. There's a lot of reserves from the Astros. You got Michael Brantley. You got Carlos Correa. You got Jose Altuve. Um, the, the reserves for the American League are talented. Uh, on the pitching side, Garrett Cole, Lance Lynn, Shane Bieber, uh, Kyle Gibson. What an awesome story. When I look at who I think is going to start the game on the mound for the AL, look, as of a week or so ago, I would have said, you know what, I think Carlos Rodon is an awesome story. I think he could have gone with either uh, White Sox pitcher, Carlos Rodon, or Lance Lynn. We can't argue with what Kyle Gibson is doing anymore. A sub-2 ERA for the Rangers, absolutely incredible, an incredible season, and I'm looking forward to watching him on the mound. And also a pitcher for the American League, Shohei Otani. So, yeah, we'll talk about that later, but he is also going to pitch in this game for the American League. So good squad out of the American League side. Want to talk about the National League side. I think the National League... From the voting perspective, we, we nailed it. I really think we nailed the, the National League. I think Max Muncy uh, over Freddie Freeman could have been the only potential difference here. But look, I'm, Freddie Freeman's been turning it on of late. What we did great as a whole voting-wise was the outfield. Jesse Winker, Nick Castellanos, and Ronald Acuna in the outfield is incredible. To have those two guys for the Reds in the outfield, awesome. We nailed that. They're having an incredible year. Obviously, Fernando Tatis Jr. becoming the face of baseball right there at shortstop. Just continues to do his thing. Hit his 27th home run the other night. Um, it's just, it's been a blast to watch him play this year. Buster Posey, man, what a story. What a story this season. Buster Posey is creeping up there in age and is having, numbers-wise, the best year of his career. I mean, absolutely incredible to, to sit out last season during, during the COVID season and to come back with this resurgence. So awesome to see him as the starting catcher for the National League side. Uh, one of the best stories uh, out, of this whole, out of this whole team as well. When I look at the reserves and the pitchers, look, what I would love the most is for Jacob deGrom to start on the mound. Obviously, deGrom makes it. He is one of, he, he is the best pitcher on the planet right now. The thing with starting an all-star game is it kind of all depends on if, if it's going to line up. Will, will it line up with your last start? And depending on the manager, sometimes they'll, they'll make it line up, you know? Uh, my brother's last All-Star start, he was supposed to start the day before the All-Star game, and they switched that around, and uh, he, ended up, he ended up starting the All-Star game because of A.J. Hinch. So that was pretty cool. 
Uh, and look, the, the rest of this team is, is stacked, obviously. Uh, you know, Muncie did end up making the team. Mookie made the team. Kyle Schwarber, I'm pumped about, the hottest hitter on the planet right now, just hitting two, three home runs every single night. Look, I'm, I'm so pumped for this All-Star game. Well, we're going to be there. The Flippin' Bats team is going to be there, so this next episode will be brought to you from there and getting a lot of content out there. I'm super excited for that. Um, but I, I really feel like we nailed it with, with this All-Star voting. I think uh, a few things could have changed here and there. Look, there's obviously always snubs. I don't want to talk about the snubs. This All-Star team is, is great as a whole. The guys that, the guys that should have made it did. Obviously, there's a few snubs, but I am super excited for this game and the guys that did end up making the team. And uh, my, my perfect scenario, if I could vote, I would vote for Jacob deGrom to start for the National League on the mound and Carlos Rodon to start on the American League side. So, look, that's it for the, uh, for the All-Star Game announcement. We finally got those teams announced. The All-Star Game is one week from Tuesday on July 13th from Denver, so I will see you guys there. But now, speaking of the All-Star game, I wanted to get into this week's Twitter poll. I know I normally do it a little later in the show, but it all kind of ties in. It all ties into the All-Star game stuff. So let's take a look at this week's Twitter poll. If you aren't following Flippin' Bats Pod on Twitter, make sure you do it, because weekly uh, we do a poll and we talk about it on the show. So make sure you're following Flippin' Bats Pod. This week's question, who's the All-Star game MVP? Gonna be. We gave you guys three options and, of course, a someone else option. Shohei Otani was an option. Vladimir Guerrero Jr. was an option. And Fernando Tatis was an option. So let's take a look at the results of this poll from what you guys voted on. And in an absolute landslide, Shohei Otani wins the vote. 52.6% of the vote goes to Shohei Otani. 27.1% 27.1% goes to someone else, 9.7% to Fernando Tatis Jr., and 10.6% to Vladimir Guerrero Jr. Look, when it comes to an all-star game MVP, it's such a toss-up. It's so hard to predict. But what I do think we, get, we did is we predicted this right. It's Shohei Otani's to lose. Look, the guy is going to hit in the all-star game, and he's going to pitch in the all-star game. It's not going to take much for him to win this. If he throws a clean inning and he gets a hit, maybe two hits out there, I think he's definitely going to be the MVP. What's it going to take to knock him off if he does that? What what does somebody else need to do? Hit two home runs and they're only two at-bats? Maybe like Jacob deGrom going out and throwing two innings and striking out six guys, not giving up a hit? I I, I don't know. But I truly believe it's Shohei Otani's to lose. Uh... We're going to see something that we have never seen in All-Star Game history. So uh, anytime you start talking about that, as long as they do a decent job at it, they're going to be MVP. So we nailed it this week. Who will win All-Star Game MVP? Shohei Otani dominating the vote. Uh, someone else getting the second place uh, number of votes. Look, I, 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 for that answer, I like to look at guys that really you know, love the limelight, step up in, in big situations like that. A guy that's not on the graphic that very well could have been is Ronald Acuna Jr., I think he could, he could end up having a great game. Uh, who knows? I think Jesse Winker could end up hitting two bombs out there in his two at-bats and, and uh, end up the MVP as well. But thank you guys for voting again. Flippin' Bats Pod on Twitter. Make sure you're there. Make sure you're voting weekly for our poll. And then we'll talk about it. We'll talk about it on the show. All right, and I want to welcome in this week's guest, reliever for the Atlanta Braves, Shane Green. Shane, what's up, man? Thanks so much for joining me. What? What's happening, brother? How you been? I'm good, man. I'm good. So listen, normally right off the start, we get started with some trivia. Trivia questions. We have a leaderboard. Actually, Fulmer's on it. Fulmer's at the top of the leaderboard with eight. So it's Fulmer and Reese Hoskins at the top with eight. So let's hit you. You got 60 seconds. Let's see how many you can get, all right? Okay. All right. Who was your first MLB strikeout? Shane Victorino. Who was your first MLB batter faced? Uh, Jackie Bradley. Yep. Who was your first MLB home run allowed to? Um, uh, Lefty was playing for the Indians. Used to be a Yankee. Uh, 
uh, I can't remember his name, but definitely played for the Indians and was a Yankee. <laughs> Who was your first MLB win against? Uh, the Indians. Yes. Number of pitches thrown in your first MLB start? Uh, um, 90. I have no Close. idea. Uh, what pitcher relieved you in your debut? No idea. CC Sabathia. What jersey number were you in your debut? Uh, my debut, 39. Yes. All right. That's it. That's it. All right. I'm actually kind of glad you couldn't get who the first MLB home run off of you was because it was Nick Swisher, and that would have just blown his ego up even more. Swisher. <laughs> Swisher. Yeah, it was Swisher. You had it. Lefty. I had it. I could see his face. I just couldn't get the name. <laughs> Uh, all right, so Shane, I wanted to ask you before we get before we get into things. I remember when you were with the Tigers, you and Nick Castellanos had like a podcast. What uh -huh. what's the deal with this? What was the deal with the podcast? And and I'm assuming it's not a thing anymore, right? Uh, yeah, no, it's definitely not a thing anymore. Um, basically, uh, we started it because our our vision was to uh, give um, everyday people, a platform to tell their story, mm -hmm. um, starting with our own stories. And then, um, our vision was to eventually get, you know, the guy that's been working at the stadium for 60 years that, you know, checks tickets that loves the game or, or lo love yeah. the Tigers, get, get hit that guy on there and hear that guy's story. And then maybe, uh, the, the woman who, uh, is an usher and has been ushering at the stadium for 20 years, let's get her on there and let's hear her story and just kind of bring everybody together in the city of Detroit and then potentially, uh, you know, go countrywide and, and just get us off the pedestal, make people understand that we're humans just like them and everybody's story is important. That's actually really cool. But, you know, it didn't, didn't, but, didn't but, stick it, with it. but then we got traded. So it, it, <laughs> it, uh, it came to a screeching halt. <laughs> you guys were traded in the, were you traded in the same year? Y'all are both gone that same year. Yeah, yeah, we got traded within like three minutes of each other. <laughs> um, all right, so I wanted to ask you about your your journey to professional baseball because it was not easy. It was not easy for you, and I yeah. know it was kind of a kind of a crazy story, but I don't know all the details. T walk me through okay. the journey to to getting drafted. To getting drafted, so uh, my freshman year, I went to the University of West Florida. Uh, in Pensacola, I went there, um, played there. I think I threw like 20 something innings. Uh, but while I was there, I found that out I needed Tommy John surgery. Um, luckily enough, the team doctor was Dr. Andrews. Um, <laughs> so he was the, at the time I didn't even know who he was. Uh, my parents were like freaking out. We're going to find the best doctor in the world that you can go to this, that, and the other. And next thing you know, we figured out that I was already talking to the best doctor in the world that I could go to at that wow. moment. So um, he he ended up doing the surgery. So that was like a huge blessing in the skies. Um, and then following my freshman year, uh, the, the baseball team at West Florida took my scholarship away and told me that I could earn it back once I could pitch again. Um, wow. So once that was a reality, I, uh, I ended up transferring from there to Daytona Beach Community College. And at the time, my roommate, my freshman year, also had Tommy John surgery and was heavily recruited by Daytona Beach Community mm -hmm. College um, and lived, lived uh, you know, closer to, to them. So he told me that he was going to go there. I asked him, talk to the coach there. Can I come with you? And long story short, met the coach. Um, had a great conversation. He he allowed both of us to come there to use the facilities to do our rehab together, and that's what we did. And then, post uh, rehab, going into that summer, um, I hadn't faced hitters in a year. Yeah. Uh, I don't had only thrown a couple of bullpens, and I reached out to uh, Jeff Deardorff, who was a Yankee scout. And when he was playing in AAA, I was going to him for hitting lessons when I was like ten. Oh, so I was so, going to ask you, how'd you know? Yank, like, it's not like you would have been yeah. in a position to be talking to a ton of scouts at that point. Yeah, yeah. Like, how'd no, you know? Him? No, no. He, he, he was like a family friend. Uh, like I said, we were going to hitting lessons with him when I was like nine or 10 years old. And then he became like a decent family friend of ours yeah. um, from the same hometown and reached out to him to, to get him to uh, watch me throw a bullpen and just 
basically reach out to some colleges and see if uh, anybody would come watch me pitch that summer so I could try to get back on a scholarship. Um, and once he decided that uh, he would help me out, he came out, watched me throw a bullpen. Um, after that bullpen, he asked me, would I be interested in playing pro ball? And I was like, well, <laughs> uh, is that a trick question? Because obviously, <laughs> right? So I had never actually thought about it, but yeah, for sure. So a um, couple weeks later, well, he basically said, when can you do this again? Because it was still very early in my rehab yeah. process. Um, and then he said, when can you do this again? And I said, give me like four or five days to uh, recover. And uh, went went back to the same like field I grew up playing on. He came out. He brought a, a rover with him. They watched me throw another bullpen. And then like two or three weeks later was the draft. And they drafted me in the 15th round. Dude, that's incredible. So – yeah, and you you went through TJ, and I'm always interested in the process because I was in the minor leagues and saw a bunch of guys rehabbing from it, and and now my brother's going through it. That mm -hmm. process for you, I, I know it's a very regimented process, but when you came back, were you? How did you feel coming back? Was it tough for you mentally to like get over that hump, or was it? You know, I, I've always heard it can be tough to come back mentally. Yeah. So my situation, because I was in college, um, you know, it was just after my freshman year. Um, you know, my, I had my whole life ahead of me still. And at this point in time, I had never been like a big prospect in high school or anything like that. So um, really, it was a decision to make, like, do I want to go through with this, number one? And number two, uh, what do I want the end result to be? And once I decided that it was um, to give it everything I had and if it didn't work out, um, to, to end up being my career, then, you know, I could look back and say, well, I did everything I, I could do. So I started it with that mentality. Um, but nobody tells you about the ups and downs going yeah. through the rehab process and how many times um, your elbow may not feel great while you're throwing. Right. And it's like, what just happened? Did I just retear something? Like there's just a lot of stuff going on. And um, with my situation, I didn't have a training staff in my ear every day to kind of like walk me through the growing pains and tell me that these are some normal things or they're not some normal things. So, um, it was tough, man, but luckily I had, like I said, I, I, I lived with, um, my buddy, Matt Collins, who ended up getting drafted by the angels the following year after me. Mm -hmm. Um, and we, we basically, without him, I don't know if I could have did it because we were on the same routine every day. We pushed each other, the things we didn't want to do. Awesome. Um, you know, if I didn't feel like doing something today, he made sure I got it done vice versa. What was uh what was your draft day like? Once you you get through that process and then <laughs> draft day comes around, what was draft day like for you? So draft day for me was texting my scout uh, Deerdorf and saying, "Hey, should I be paying attention to this thing or not?" <laughs> and he said, <laughs> "He said, yeah, uh, pay attention after the tenth round and we'll see what happens." So um, I'm at my buddy Gary's house. We're playing Call of Duty and we just have like the draft going on on the computer just like with the <laughs> volume on and uh we were locked in the call of duty at the time so we didn't even realize that the computer had died and the draft <laughs> was still going on and next next thing you know my, my dad and his dad come like storming into the house and they're super excited they're telling me i got drafted i don't even really know what's going on it all happened so fast like i couldn't actually grasp what was going on that I was getting drafted by the New York Yankees, you know, <laughs> three weeks prior to that, I was just literally trying to find a college team to play for. Right. Um, so it was all crazy. And then Jeff, Jeff ended up calling me, congratulating me. And it still didn't really feel like, you know, it didn't really hit me. It, felt, it was so surreal. Um, and then once he called me the next day and was asking me like, Hey, how much money is it going to cost to get you to sign? That's when it hit me, and I had no idea. Like, never once have I thought about how much money <laughs> it would take for me to play pro ball other than an invitation, you know? Um, wow. So I threw a number at him, and I literally just out of the air. I said, 250 grand. I don't know. Tell him that. He said, okay, great. I'll call you back. <laughs> and he called me back and said, uh, they'll give you $100,000. I said, Jeff, send me the address. I'll be there tomorrow. <laughs> so that's, <laughs> that, that's how it went down. It was, it was crazy, man. Uh, it was definitely uh, a story in a, in a time that I'll never forget. That's crazy, man. And, and then things don't get easier 
once you get to pro no. ball. And this is, you know, this is all the, the highest level I've experienced is, is grinding it out in the minor leagues. And it is exactly that. It, it's a grind. So you go through all of that. You get drafted. You get to the minor leagues where you're just grinding away for, you know, it can be years at a time making absolutely no money. Um, in your minor league experience, what's what's like a, a story or you know something funny that you'll you'll take with you forever? Because I know there's tons of stories that nobody nobody oh, yeah. can imagine. Yeah, for sure. The minor leagues is something that most people have no idea how it all works. Uh, but the camaraderie you have with the boys, you experienced it, man. Um, it's it's even different than it is in the in the big leagues, just because the grind is so different. I mean, you got five guys living in a two bedroom apartment, uh, <laughs> riding on buses for ten hours a day. You know, so um, like the the friendships I have with the guys that I played with uh, up through the minor leagues are, are friendships that I'll have for the rest of my entire life. Um, and we've all you know gone our separate ways. I'm 32 now, and I was in the minor leagues for five years. Um, you know, and that was like, I went to college for two years, but like the minor leagues, your first couple of years, is kind of like your college years. Right. Yeah. So um, we probably made some decisions that we shouldn't have made, but uh, <laughs> with those decisions, with those decisions came awesome memories, man. And, and I think the, the biggest thing I got out of the minor leagues, other than obviously learning the game of baseball was, was the friendships that I, that I made along the way, for sure. I'd be an idiot if I didn't ask you, are there any of the store, are there any, of the memories of things you probably shouldn't have done where that turned into great memories that you are able to tell us right now that are, that are like PG 13 or better. Um, I don't know if they're PG 13 or better, but eh, I will say we can cut that it out if we need uh, to. when I was, yeah, when I was, when I was, when I was playing in Tampa uh, for the Tampa Yankees, the group of guys that I had uh, with me in that locker room, we had the most fun of all time. Uh, probably affected my numbers on the field a little <laughs> bit, but uh, I learned that year that like, okay, you can have fun, but there's also business to this too. So um, realistically that year, even though I probably partied a little too much, I learned that like there's a place for fun and there's a, also a place to to flip the switch and, and, and get the job done. Um, I don't know if I have any specific stories I can really tell on here, but uh, we had a lot of fun, man. We definitely had a lot of fun. I don't know how you did it in, in Tampa because I, I played in Lakeland for two plus years, and, and every time we go to Tampa, that's like the spot. When you go play yep. the Yankees, that's the spot, and, and you're gonna, you, you go out most nights. So playing in that and, – and those guys were out every night. I remember like my first year in Lakeland, every time we'd go play Tampa, we'd see like – judge out every night in tampa and it's like all the yankees are out at night in 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 tampa and it's like i don't i don't know yeah. i don't know how you played there and well you said yeah your, we, your we, numbers probably we made it out alive that's what matters <laughs> so you end up making it to the big leagues in 2014 which happened to actually be Derek jeter's farewell tour so th that's got to be a yes, whirlwind what, what's it like getting to the big leagues and being able to play with the captain of the New York Yankees while he's on his farewell tour? Um, it was crazy, man. I was – one, I made it to the big leagues, which is a world win in its own, right? And uh, my my debut didn't go great, and then I got called back up, and then I was pitching really, really well, and I'm in a Yankee locker room putting on pinstripes, and Derek Jeter's my teammate, and it's his farewell tour, and then – I, I actually got the start on Derek Jeter Day uh, when they did his ceremony pregame. Oh, so I was cool. the starting pitcher that day, and so that was crazy. Um, it was just all so crazy, man. The, the, really, the craziest thing is you grow up uh, idolizing these guys, right? And then next thing you know, you're in a locker room with them, and it's like you put them on a pedestal for sure, but it only takes a couple of days where they just feel like teammates. And you have to you have to stand back and be like, wow, like that's Derek Jeter. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, but but the easiest the easiest way to do that was his. I mean, his last game in Yankee Stadium is a memory that I'll never. I, I don't I don't know. Trust me, I want to win a World Series and I want to win one really bad. But like that moment, being a rookie and the guy that I grew up watching, the captain, 
having his last day at Yankee Stadium and then hitting that walk off like I'm getting goosebumps right now just thinking about it like that was the roller coaster of emotions in that stadium and in that dugout and on that field that day was something that everybody there will never ever ever forget that's kind of a moment where everybody that's a baseball fan or even a lot of baseball even people that aren't huge baseball fans that's a moment in sports history it's like where were you and for you, yeah, you were right there, and and I, that's I was jump I was jumping over the rail and running onto the field, and that's that's pretty cool. So you mentioned yeah. that your debut, your debut didn't go great, and then you come back and and you start throwing really well, and then um you know and then and then you become part of trade rumors and end up getting traded. But I wanted to ask you, I talk a lot about the mentality of baseball. Um, just because you know I, I got to experience baseball at a high level, not the highest. Uh, that you've gotten to, but at a point where it all becomes about who can separate themselves mentally. And I, mm -hmm. I, I firmly believe that once you get to professional baseball, everybody there is, is gifted athletically. It really becomes about can you separate yourself mentally? Because I, I've gone through stretches where I go 0 for 4, then 0 for 8, and then it turns into I, – I, I can't do like the, you just bog yourself down so much that you can get into a mental funk that affects you forever. So when what changed for you at the big league level to come back up and to be able to have the success that you did? Was it something physical or was it something mental? Um, probably both. Right. So I, when I made my debut, uh, I came in in relief and. It just did. I walked the first guy. I was the most nervous you could ever be. Blacked out, nervous. I don't even really remember anything, uh, other than it was not good. And it, it all and it all happened so fast. Uh, and then I got sent down like two days later. And then, um, like at that moment, I was like, okay, uh, I'm a big leaguer, right? But obviously, I got a lot of work to do. Um, so I went back, you know, went, went back to the work and focus on, you know, your routine or your process or, or however you want to word it, but just focus on that day to day. Um, and then make sure you do everything that you can to be prepared for that next opportunity. And then when I got that opportunity, um, mentally, I felt like I was ready for it. Um, and then, you know, it's still my big, my, my first big league start. So there's a lot of nerves involved, uh, a little bit of adrenaline that'll make you black out right but um what i knew for sure was that i was gonna just leave it all in the field um compete to the fullest and if it didn't work out we'd go back to the drawing board and um taking that mentality onto the field uh you know i, I got good results and then it's like was it good enough to stay here am i gonna get to sit back down you start you know all those kinds of thoughts start coming in your head and then next thing you know you're 15 starts into your major league career um and then you and then you get traded, but I think I think the biggest thing uh, that you kind of touched on was uh, people don't realize that like once you get to the big leagues, everybody is the best in, in the world, right? So um, I I truly believe that the people that are in the Hall of Fame may not necessarily be the most talented players that ever played in the league, but they were 100% the best at dealing with the ups and downs of the results. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I agree. And, and I, I, I experienced this at the, at the minor league level where I, I, you know, self admittedly, I, I wasn't great at it. I would, when I, when I was good, I was on top of the world and could do no wrong. And, and it looked like a beach ball, but when, and it was when I was struggling that, you know, I, I didn't know how to get out of it. And, and I, I truly believe, and, and I'm with you, I, I think the best in the world know how to, to close that gap. And there aren't mm -hmm. as many ups and downs and the ups and downs aren't as high. They're just consistent and, and they know how to, to get themselves out of a funk quicker, quicker than most people would be able to. I, I, I do believe that. Um, I was just going to say 100 percent. I mean, honestly, uh, being teammates with your brother, watch, watching him do his thing. He's he's obviously one of the best to do it. Um, and, you know, the the guy has a plan. He's got a process. He's the most competitive human being I've probably ever met in my entire life. Uh, from the second he walks into the clubhouse on his start day, he's already a hundred percent locked in yeah. and he's a hundred percent business that day. And like people, people, 
you know, can watch from afar and not learn anything, but, you know, I, I watched and observed and tried to soak in as much as possible. And seeing that to me was just like, okay, there's a five day process for him. But at the end of the day, this, like, I always go back to boxing like that, that day is his fight. That's his fight night. And when he gets in the ring, uh, he's going to throw his haymakers and he's going to fight until the end. And if he's the one that's laying on the, on the mat, then the next five days, he's going to figure out how to make sure that never happens again. And I think that that is the process and that is what eliminates the highs and the lows of, of the results is, you know, always moving forward. What's happened has happened good, bad, or ugly. Uh, it really means nothing now because all I can do is control right this second. Do you try and pitch angry? Uh, I definitely am better when I'm pitching angry. Yes. But for me, I have to almost, uh, I have to like spike my heart rate and like get as jacked up as possible so that the entire time I'm on the mound, I'm trying to like bring that down. So my, my focus the entire time is just calm. But if I'm too calm when I start, then I end up being way too calm during competition interesting if that makes sense yeah so but so and then there, there's imagine, kind of a, there's kind of a mixture i guess i imagine as a guy that you know that started and was a starter it, it's got to be a totally different like prep from once you get to the bullpen if you if you like to pitch a little angry and have that heart rate spiked how in in the bullpen i mean i i know i i played outfield for years the bullpen guys are sitting behind me with their feet kicked up and like bored out of their minds how would you go about preparing you know once you got the call once the once the bullpen phone rang what would you do to to get yourself from that i'm bored out of my mind mindset to all right it's time to go i need to get angry i need to get my heart rate up so when i first got switched to the bullpen um it was 2016, I think. And uh, at the time, Justin Wilson was my locker mate, also my teammate, had been in the bullpen, you know, back back in inning guy, um, proving himself there, and we were good friends. And um, day one, I was like, Jay Willie, man, what do you got for me? Like, what am I supposed to do? And he said, I don't care what you do, but do it every day. And I said, okay. And so – Taking that advice, I, I basically just did trial and error as far as like routine goes for in the bullpen, right? And to be 100% honest with you, like that trial and error is still going on. Um, you know, you do something every day for two months and then uh, potentially it starts creating bad habits. And then next thing you know, uh, you created a new routine that will hopefully create good habits. Um, but as far as like when the phone rings, the atmosphere of the game and the stadium will help you a lot. But uh, when you got a, a decent idea that your name's going to be called when the phone rings, just hearing the phone ring will spike the heart rate pretty good. Um, and then uh, for me specifically, I drink a lot of pre-workout before I pitch. And so that <laughs> definitely helps. That, that definitely helps also. So, um, you know, little stretch, little stretch routine to get loose and get ready. And then, uh, you know, once you feel like you're you're there, then you're sitting back down with your feet propped up, waiting for the phone to ring. <laughs> and uh, as soon as that phone rings, it's it's go time. Uh, so, what was it like for you being a part of of that trade? You were part of a three team trade that involved, you know, Didi Gregorius and Robbie Ray and some some mm -hmm. now established big time names. What's it like, uh, you know, having the journey you did and getting to the big leagues and then being a part of a trade? I can't imagine. Uh, so that so that day, the day I got traded, uh, I I was sleeping in and I woke up and I had like 25 text messages from like in my group message with my best friends that I grew up with, and uh, like before I can even read those, one of them is calling me and I answer the phone and they're like, "Yo, are you about to get traded? Wake up!" And I'm like, "I don't know. Am I about to get traded?" <laughs> and then while I'm on, while I'm on the phone with him, my agent called me. And I flipped over to him and he's like, hey, uh, rumors going around that potentially you'll be traded. Um, they look like they could be true. So just a heads up, be by your phone. And I'm like, all right, well, maybe I should get out of bed and brush my teeth and see see what today has to hold. <laughs> so uh, I got up, put on the MLB network, sat on my couch, and just waited for my phone to ring. And it rang about an hour and a half later. Wow. And then you end up going to Detroit. 
uh, your, your career, you know, I don't want to say it totally changed because you had success in New York, but, you know, it's a different path for you and you're in Detroit and you end yeah. up carving out an all-star type career there. And in, in 2019, you become an all-star and you become the first person ever with, with seven saves in, in, in a 10 game span. And, you know, it, you, you just establish yourself in a closer type role and, uh, you know, it's incredible. And I, I actually saw you at that all-star game. It was in Cleveland. Um, what, what was that experience like for you? I know we're coming up on an all-star game uh, here soon. What, what was your favorite experience or memory from that all-star game? Um, my favorite experience or memory, I think, was um, that was like the most nervous I've ever been for like standing on the line for the national anthem. Like looking up in the crowd and seeing all my best friends there, my family there, like, that ben moment Verlander. for me was, yeah, yeah, <laughs> and, and that that moment for me, man, was like, that was almost like an I made it moment, I guess. Um, you know, you never want to get complacent, but like, there's definitely some checkpoints along the way, and that was one of those checkpoints. Um, so I, I think that 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 national anthem was was the most goosebumps I've ever had during a national anthem for sure. Um, but the whole experience, the whole weekend, just, you know, the home run derby, even like being on the field for the home run derby as a kid, I always wanted to be out in the outfield shagging for the home run derby. And now I'm like on the team watching one of my teammates perform in the home run derby, you know, so it was the whole experience, the whole weekend was a lot of fun. Uh, I know the, the process is different for pitchers than it is position players. Position players get voted in. The whole process to get in as a pitcher isn't the same. So w were you caught off guard? Were you surprised when you got the call? And, and where were you? Um, I wasn't surprised. I, I knew that my numbers on paper were really good. Um, the, the team at the time, the Tigers, we were struggling. But uh, I think... I don't, I don't even remember the exact numbers now, but I had like 20 saves or something with like a one. Uh, so I knew that just on paper, I looked like an all-star, but kind of like you said, like I don't know how it all even works still really. Um, but I knew someone on our team had to go. So my fingers were definitely crossed. Uh, my family was talking about it and I was trying not to think about it. But uh, when, I, when I got the, I was at the field and they basically came and got me, called me in the uh, Guardy's office, and Guardy told me, congratulations, you know, I'm going to represent the team as an all-star. And um, I, I, when, I, when I was in high school, I hated being late to class because I don't like people staring at me, like walking into the room. <laughs> and then we basically had a team meeting right after that so that they could tell everybody that I was the all-star. And, like, because I felt so awkward at that very moment, it hadn't really hit me yet because I was preparing myself to have to walk through a room while everybody's <laughs> staring at me again. But but after that and everybody would come and hugging me, congratulating me and stuff, man, it was it was it was an awesome moment, an awesome feeling. Um the boys were happy for me. I was super, super excited. So um it was it was awesome. And and not too long after that you become an Atlanta Brave, uh where you are now and you know, throw well for them and, and you know, you end up last year you you're, you end up throwing in the playoffs with them and then it got to this year and I'm looking in the off season and, and, you know, watching what's happening with you and you weren't getting signed and, you know, the season started and it's still like, look, uh, somebody needs to sign this guy and you're just, you just hadn't been signed yet. What, what was that? Was it weird in the off season, just continuing to throw and get ready for the season, but not being on a team and just staying prepped and ready for somebody to call you? Yeah, it was extremely stressful, man. Um, you know, you know how the system's set up. So you got to be in the big leagues for six years before you're in control of your own destiny. Right. right. And only 1800 people have done it for 10 years or more. So getting the six years is not an easy feat. So when you get there, um, it's almost like a, whew, we made it with a lot of excitement because this is supposed to be when you get right. Control. What you burned. Right. And, uh, you know, with the whole COVID season and, uh, everything going on, uh, it was just so like such a gray area. There were so many question marks as to where the market was going to be, um, all these kinds of things. And, and then also like how players are graded out now with all the, the numbers that, that you can get on the metrics of pitches and 
there's just like the ERA doesn't mean as much anymore as maybe as it used to, because there's just so many more things that you can look at to see if the ERA is accurate, you know, things like that. So um, I had no idea what to expect. Obviously I had been through arbitration, but arbitration and free agency are not even close to the same thing. Yeah. Um, and then you start seeing guys go off the board, um, sign in, you know, pretty, pretty decent numbers for having a COVID thing hanging over the market. Right. And then Hendrick signs a record breaking deal. So I'm like, okay, maybe the market's going to be, it's going to be a good market. Teams are going to be calling here soon. And, uh, next thing, you know, there's a couple teams calling and not really putting much on the table. And, um, like I said, I was at the point in my career where like I had earned more than that. I thought, and, uh, this was the moment where I'm supposed to make the most money I will ever make in my entire life. And the last time there was an all-star game, I pitched in it. And so I thought I was sitting in a, a relatively strong position. Um, but at the end of the day, it's like selling a house, I guess, if nobody wants to pay that much for the house, then you can't sell it for that much. Um, so it got ugly. Uh, I, at the beginning of the off season in my perfect world scenario, I wanted to be a brave, uh, from the beginning. Um, I felt like there was some business we needed to finish and, you know, I love it here. I love the team, love the boys. Uh, so coming back here was a priority, but it's a business. So I wasn't sure if that was going to happen. And fast forward to opening day, I'm at Matt Boyd's house. He's letting me stay there so I can go to drive line and, it's opening day and everybody, every baseball player in the world's excited. And I'm laying on the floor in Boyd's living room, watching the first pitch of the season, you know? So it was just a weird, stressful, crazy time in my life that I learned a lot about who I am as a person, as a human, not just a baseball player and how savage this business is. Um, how much of a lion at the circus we all really are. Um, and it was tough to handle, man. And, you know, I'd be lying if I told you I don't still think about it all the time. But, you know, I, I'm, I'm doing my best to um, enjoy being a baseball player again because one day they're going to tell me I can't even play anymore no matter what. So, um, you know, I get to play in the major leagues and I get to compete with um, amazing guys next to me uh, and live my dream with an Atlanta Brave hat on, which I grew up wearing. I was the biggest Braves fan ever as a kid. So um, with all those things being said, man, I, it was a crazy time. Free agency is nuts. Uh, I wish no player has to go through what I had to go through um, in the future. And uh, I'm a baseball player now, so life is good. But, you know, you mentioned it. You said it's kind of like you're lying at the circus. And I've, I've said this a lot. At, at the professional level, you're, you're nothing more than a number on a piece of paper to, to the owners. And what kind of numbers can you put up? And, you know, I, I don't, it sounds like you were thinking about it at the time, but you, had, you could have gone back and, and played and been ready for opening day. But it's like you, you stood your ground. And, you know, I, I know more people than just yourself are, are proud of that because, that's how that's how they kind of shift the market in their favor is get guys that feel like they don't have an option and and next thing you know they've signed for less and then the market starts shifting and and you holding out naturally injuries are going to happen or teams aren't playing well and it's like oh okay Shane was right the, he does deserve this money we do want him now come on in we'd love to have you and it's like that I I really feel like that's important for major league baseball players for sure um it's a, it's a really dicey topic, man, because, uh, you know, I, I still didn't, in my opinion, get the amount of money that I should have gotten even yeah. for a one-year deal. But um, there's no secret that the longer that you hold out and the less that you play this year, the more that's going to hurt you right. because now you have no numbers to put in front of a team to show how much you think you're worth, right? So yeah. they know that just as much as I know that. Um, although the team is a team that's trying to win a championship, um, unfortunately, there's people that own teams that potentially own the team because it's an asset in their portfolio and Correct. not because they want to bring a championship to the city that that team represents. 
And that creates an environment that is very dicey. Um, so that's how it becomes cutthroat basically. And, um, it's crazy, man. It's, it's a wildfire out there. Yeah. <laughs> it, it really, it really is. But like I said, I'm happy to be a baseball player. I can talk about that forever because <laughs> I was by myself for two months and I have a lot of thoughts that potentially are controversy um, or controversial. So um, for the sake of my own happiness at the current <laughs> moment, I'm a, I'm a baseball player. I love playing baseball and I want to do it for at least 10 more years. I'm I'm pumped for you, man. I'm I'm glad I didn't know you grew up a huge Atlanta Braves fan. So it's so cool to see you yeah. on on a team and and going in the playoffs and and hopefully you guys can get back there this year. Um, you know, so you're in that situation and you come back and basically right when you know right around the time when you get back to the big leagues and and get yourself back to being able to get on a major league pitcher's mound. There's uh you know some craziness happening in the big leagues <laughs> and and from from my perspective and and look we don't need to get into the logistics of who uses what and all of that but look we both know how deep rooted in baseball history using substances is on a baseball sunscreen and rosin for instance is is used by everybody i saw it every single time a pitcher would come in from the game do you think how would you handle this as how would you best handle this do you think a mid-season crackdown was the answer I think that a mid-season crackdown is a answer. Mm -hmm. uh, the answer, I don't know if anybody truly knows because it's such a gray area, man. Like, people have been, call it sticky, call it whatever you want. People have been using stuff to grip the baseball forever, right? Like, for the, the rosin bag has been there forever which means the concept has been there forever. Uh, literally for, I just and wrote an article that, about this. Literally since 1920 is when pitchers started yeah. doing stuff to the baseball. And that's never, never stopped. Literally since it was outlawed right. in 1921. You know, pitchers were using sandpaper or pine tar or an emery board or, you know, pine tar and rosin or whatever you want to call it. So, yeah, 100% since sure. the beginning of time. So, so that's been going on since the beginning. Um you know, I've seen I've seen hitters put pine tar too high up on their bat or, you know, mm -hmm. how many times have you put your bat on the sink in the bathroom to make the wood harder or oh, whatever yeah. it is? You know, like everybody's always trying to get an edge. Um, I think that just like probably there's some crazy laws out there that were written way back when that are worded crazy that were just never rewritten. There's probably some baseball rules that were written way back when that are worded differently than they would be if the same rule was written today uh so there's just things that happen in the game that have been happening forever um i think that this is also another dicey uh, uh, uh topic but i i think that um in my opinion there's been more homers than ever for like four years in a yeah. row right so uh, is it because guys are throwing harder? Probably. Launch angles, too? Probably. So a little bit of a perfect storm. But uh, I'm, I think it's no secret that the balls have changed. Oh, yeah. I don't, I don't know if they've changed on purpose or not on purpose, but I have a ball from 2016 in my locker that I traced my fingers on for my slider grip. And every time I grab that ball, it feels huge in my hand. Really? And so I, 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 I mess with teammates sometimes and I toss it to them to see like if they notice. And sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. But every time I grab it, I'm like, man, this feels big. Um, so <laughs> I think the balls are different. I also think uh, that the guys um, that say, you know, average is down or, or, or whatever, yeah. um, I don't 1 million percent buy it. I mean, baseball is the hardest game in the world. You can do everything perfectly right and be the worst player on the field that day and do everything perfectly wrong and be the best player on the field that day. Um, so there's so many human elements involved that I think it's unfortunate that they just assume that pitchers are cheating because right. the averages are down. Um, before the Cubs threw that no-hitter, there was six no-hitters only against three teams in the league, and nobody – like thinks that that's a red flag. Um, nothing against any of those players, but 
It's just potentially there's guys in the league that aren't ready to be at right. this level yet. Right. You know, so maybe that's why the averages are down a little bit, which, you know, if the team's rebuilding and that's the route they're going, then that's that's the route they're going. But maybe that's why some averages are down. I mean, I don't know how many homers Ronald has right now, but that guy's doing fine with whatever kind of <laughs> anything anybody is doing. Fine, you know what yeah. I mean? So, yeah, like there's guys in the league that are the best in the world and it's not affecting them. So, um, I don't know, man, it's, it's a dicey situation. I, I, I think that the gray area is the problem because, uh, yeah. nobody really even knows what they're looking for. I don't think right. nobody knows, like there wasn't a good description of exactly what we should do or how we should do it other than, oh, we're checking you and you're getting suspended if you have something on your gloves <laughs> that's sticky. Well, what does that even truly mean? You know, like. I used to always put sunscreen and rosin on the palm of my left hand because I have these little baby Burger King hands and my glove (laughs) shakes like crazy when I'm pitching and it drives me nuts. So putting sunscreen and rosin on my glove hand and then putting my hand in my glove was literally so my glove doesn't move. And now I'm not doing that. I'm getting a small blister on my thumb and it's driving me insane. And like, I never take my glove off, not one time to like rub up the ball, nothing. But I can't do that now because if I were to do that and then get banged 10 games, like now, right. now what now I'm all of a sudden I'm just deemed a cheater. Right. Like, I, I don't know. It's just, there's just a lot of gray area. Um, I definitely think that, you know, as time goes on, we'll come to a better solution, I think. But, um, you know, the MLB felt like they needed to do something now and that's what they did. And like we've already said, we're the lions at the circus. So I just got to play by the rules. Yeah. So I want to, and I I ask everybody this question. I I want you to put yourself in the shoes of the commissioner. And I I think baseball is going in such a good direction. We have so many young players like Acuna, who you just mentioned, Mm -hmm. and Tatis, and Otani, and Vladdy Guerrero Jr. And baseball is changing in the eyes of, you know, the the unwritten rules are sort of a thing in the past, a a lot of them. And, And I think it's becoming very exciting. And if you were commissioner, what is one rule that you would either change or implement uh, for the betterment of the game of baseball? I would take the strike zone box off of the television. Yeah, I think that is a, I think the people that are watching at home that are saying this strike zone is brutal. We just never had that box there for so long. Yeah. Well, and, 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 and like, I just, I find it hard to believe that the box can be accurate at every stadium because every camera angle is different. I mean, I'm not, I'm not a scientist, right? So like maybe they have technology that can make it exactly the same at each field. I don't know. But my brain tells me that there's no way those are exactly perfectly accurate. And with that box on the screen, just starts a whole snowball effect of negativity coming from yeah. the people that are commentating the game, right? And it's like if a guy punches out with bases loaded, now it's because he's swinging with the launch angle, so that's stupid. And if a guy thro- if a, if a guy throws a slider in the dirt two zero, well, it's because all he's trying to do is strike people out, and he's stupid. And it, it's just like it's very very negative. I, I, like I said, I was watching a lot of baseball at the beginning of the season because I didn't have a job, and I had no idea how negative everybody is while talking about these games. And then the fans are sitting there watching the game, and, like, why would you want to watch something that the people that are working in the business is just talking crap about all the time? So it's yeah. like they're making it not fun for the fans because all they talk about is why it's so bad or why this guy stinks or why that guy stinks. So there's just a lot of negativity Uh kind of going on with the whole situation and i think that like the easiest way to start cutting that out is just get that off the screen so fans can stop arguing about stuff that doesn't matter because there's a human umpire back there that's gonna make the right call sometimes and gonna make the wrong call sometimes and that's the way the game's supposed to be played yeah i agree so not a fan of the automated strike zone that could potentially be coming yeah no i i don't i don't I think before we have an automated strike zone, we should have a camera that looks straight up the foul pole so we know if homers are, are Dude, foul or fail. Dude, I just said that. 100% agree. It's 2021, and I mean, it's still 2021. Not able to tell if a home run was fair or foul. 100%. A laser or a camera or something. I agree. All right, so I got three career moment questions for you. All right, the first one is, okay. 
What was your welcome to the big leagues moment? Um, my welcome to the big leagues moment. I don't know if this was if this is considered a welcome to the big leagues moment, but my first major league start in Yankee Stadium. It was my third major league start. It was the first one that my parents made it to. Mm -hmm. um, I had three errors in one game as a pitcher, which is really tough to do. Yes, it is. Uh, I was like the first guy since Tommy John in 1970 to do it or something. <laughs> but uh, I got another opportunity. I got, a, I got a fourth PFP opportunity, ground ball to me. Caught it, threw it the first, got the out, and I got a standing ovation in Yankee Stadium <laughs> that erupted. So uh, that, for whatever reason, like that standing ovation, that moment for me was like a, uh, like it's still a game, you know. Like we we get it, you you know what you know what I mean. Like it was well, they weren't booing me yet, they were, but they were telling me like, get it together out there, you know what I mean. Uh, that 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 was a, a big league moment for me for sure. <laughs> Yeah, I love that. Uh, what is your most memorable play that you have made on the field? Uh, probably the play during that start. The fourth I one? Handed the ball <laughs> over, over, over. No, I underhanded the ball. I was running, and I was just going to flip it to the first baseman, and I saw the runner coming in hot, and I panicked, and I flipped it underhand all the way to the tarp. And that that – that's the that was on not top 10 plays that was that's my most memorable play even though it's not not the best of memories but uh that one will last forever so this was this was on a ground ball back to you guy going to first you freak out yep. underhanded and just hold on to it too long and it goes way over the head's head to, to the tarp all, all the way to the tarp <laughs> <laughs> it's tough to do but i did it and i did it in the show so i'll never forget it uh, and what is a moment that stands out to you with teammates that has taken place off the field? Um, off the field? Yeah. Uh, probably go. It, it's probably going to go to back to my minor league guys, man. We we started going on a duck hunting trip uh, every year for like six years in a row. There'd be like anywhere from four to eight of us uh, out there and like being out in the middle of nowhere, uh, you know, campfire nights, storytelling, like reliving the moments, like every year for like six or seven years, that was, that's probably my best off the field, like teammates memory. And that's, that's with my minor league boys. That's awesome, man. Well, Shane, thank you so much for joining me, man. Uh, I don't, I know you got drafted while playing cod. I don't know if you still play much anymore, but we gotta, we gotta get on the stick sometime and drop in sometime. Sounds good, brother. I right, appreciate man. you having me, man. Good talking to you. Right, Tell your course, brother man. I said, hey, keep grinding. I will. Thank you so much for joining me. I appreciate it. Good luck the rest of the way. You guys are my World Series prediction, so I hope you get in the playoffs and tear it up and become World Series champs, man. I love to hear it. Chop on, baby. All right, man. See ya. All right. I wanted to thank Shane Green again for joining me. That was actually really cool to hear him talking about his downtime when he didn't have a team and kind of take us through that whole process and, and be honest about that whole process. That was Really, really cool, I thought. So I wanted to thank Shane Green again for joining me on this week's episode. But now it is time for the hotline questions where you guys can call into the show, ask me whatever you want, talk about whatever you want. The number is 213-537-9339. So keep getting those calls in. Rick, hit me with the first voicemail. Hey, Ben. So what's up with the Phillies bullpen? And really, what can be done to help them not – be blowing saves and also would you say it's Joe Girardi's fault but then again he really doesn't have anything to work with thanks love the pod thank you for the question what is up with the Phillies bullpen and how can they not be so bad is <laughs> essentially the question look and you're right I don't I don't believe this is Joe Girardi's fault he's only given the arms out there that he has and there's nobody out there that he can rely on, that he can count on. Not a single person. There's some great arms at the back end of the Phillies bullpen, but none of them are reliable. Somebody's always got control issues on one day, or, you know, they just don't have their stuff one day. You're right, it's really painful to watch the Phillies team right now. I, I, look, they're still in it because it's the NL East, and the NL East is 
really strange this year, and everybody besides the Mets is under 500. So the Phillies obviously are still in it, and and I, I believe their offense is is good enough to to win. And I think the top end of the rotation is just as good as anybody with with Aaron Nola and Zach Wheeler, who's an All Star this year. Um, this rotation's awesome. It's it's just the back end of their bullpen. If games are only seven innings, this team would be incredible and in first place in this division. But they're not. So I don't I don't know I don't know what you do. I feel like you got to go out and and get a bullpen arm. But you're right. I I don't know. Um, I don't know the answer back there. None of the none of their arms are performing. You know, Jose Alvarado is a big piece they bought they brought in, but he's got electric stuff, but he just doesn't know where it's going half the time. So he's not a guy you can count on. Hector Neris was was a guy that was the closer. He gets booted out of the closer role. You know, they no, they don't know what to do. Nobody knows what to do. I don't know what to do. Joe Girardi doesn't know what to do. Uh, the only answer for the Phillies bullpen would be going out and getting somebody to help it. That's literally the only answer. Uh, so, yeah, thank you for your question, uh, but I'm right there with you. The Phillies bullpen needs a lot of help. So, next question. Hi, Ben. I'm Nicholas Poindexter. Uh, I was just calling, and I want to hear your opinion. What is the biggest part of the A's success with a lackluster lineup in the middle part? And this is coming from an A's fan. Thank you. Hope you have a great day. Enjoy the podcast. And if I can get put on the podcast after Michael Former, that would be amazing. Bye. <laughs> First off, Nicholas Poindexter is absolutely an incredible name. So, Nicholas Poindexter, thank you for calling. Uh, and you asked about the A's. Look, the Oakland A's are uh, such an interesting team. They always win with a roster that shouldn't be winning. So this is a great question. What is it? What is it about this team that they keep winning? And, you know, without doubt, they go out, they go on a crazy, insane stretch at the end of the year and end up making the playoffs every single year. What is it? Look, I think with this Oakland A's team, it's, it's the culture there. It's that, it's that small ball, money ball culture and mentality that they have there. And it's been proven to work. But here's the thing. It has been proven to work to get into the playoffs. Is that the goal? Is the goal to get into the playoffs? Because the way the Oakland A's play, it gets you to the playoffs. And it's incredible when they do it. But what they don't have, in my opinion, is the firepower that it takes to win in the postseason. But I really, it's impressive what these guys do. You know, that they kind of were on the analytics bandwagon before anybody. Uh, You know, them and the Rays are both up there in that category. Uh, They just do things the right way. They take their walks. They play good defense. They pitch well. They pitch well enough. That's what it is with this team. There's not a single person in that lineup besides maybe Matt Olson this year that's like, oh, my God, this guy's a superstar. They don't have those guys. But they go out and win games. And I think it's, you know, it's Bob Melvin. They're leading this team. He does an incredible job. And it's that analytical money ball mindset that I think is a, is a huge reason for the Oakland A's success. And, you know, right now they're sitting uh, in second place in the AL West behind the Astros. But I can almost guarantee you at some point in the second half, they're going to go on an insane run and put themselves in position to, to get a wild card spot and make it to, into the playoffs. It's absolutely incredible what those guys do so thank you for this week's questions uh for the hotline questions again that number is 213-537-9339 so keep calling weekly guys i love this segment i love having you be part of the show and being able to talk to you guys and answer your questions or or whatever it may be so thank you again to you guys that called but now it is time for this week in shohei otani news what another outstanding week from Shohei Otani the Angels travel to New York the first two games he plays in New York the mecca of baseball the holy grail all the history there everyone's saying ah can he really do this in New York well the first two games he played there he hit three home runs killed it but then we get to his start he started the third game of that series and it didn't go well it didn't go well he didn't get out of the first inning Uh, He definitely struggled. Uh, He definitely had some misfortune there. 
I, I believe there were five missed calls in total in that first inning that were definitely uh, tough. But look, uh, these aren't excuses. He didn't have a good start. He didn't have a great start. Uh, he goes into Yankee Stadium, gives up a bunch of runs, seven earned runs in uh, two-thirds of an inning, uh, threw 41 pitches, just not, not great, and uh, ends up getting pulled, and that was it for his start last week. But you know what he did after that? You know what he continued on to do? He hit bombs the rest of the week. Literally the following game. The game right after that bad start, everyone, everyone starts freaking out. Oh, is, you know, this is the, everyone's saying MVP, not anymore. You know what that start proved to me? That Shohei Otani is human. He's human. And then he continues on, and he starts hitting some bombs. He ends up hitting number 30 the following game, hits two home runs, number 29 and number 30, making him the fastest player in all of baseball this year to hit 30 home runs. Uh, he also ended up scoring that game on a, on a walk-off hit. He's the one that ended up scoring. His sprint speed was incredible. Uh, ended up scoring bang, bang play at the plate, dives in, uh, kind of like a little collision at home play, and he just sits there with his arms up in the air and goes, yes! It was incredible. Um, yeah, and then the coolest thing, in my opinion, I've been telling you guys all season, what he's doing is special. What he's doing is special. You guys have heard that from me enough this year. I know you know at this point that what he's doing is special. But Shohei Otani was voted into the All-Star game as the starting DH. He will be hitting in the All-Star game. He also got selected to be a pitcher in the All-Star game, making him the first player in Major League Baseball history to be invited to the All-Star game to do both. The first player in over a century of this game to be invited to the All-Star game and is going to pitch and hit in this All-Star game. That's incredible. That's absolutely incredible. Uh, Shohei Otani ended up going on to hit another homer this week. He's currently sitting at 31, which ties him for the most home runs in a season by a Japanese-born player with Hideki Matsui. It's the beginning of July. Shohei Otani is on pace to hit 60 home runs. My worry is that teams are going to start pitching around him, and they already are. Shohei Otani, more than anybody, needs Mike Trout back. He needs that protection in the lineup because teams are going to start pitching around him. But he is already, at the beginning of July, tied with Hideki Matsui for the most home runs in history as a Japanese-born player. Absolutely incredible. Another great week from Shohei Otani. The rough start on the mound just showed us that he's human, uh, but he continued on and uh, is making me believe again that he's, you know, he might not actually be human after all. He's absolutely incredible. And another great week out of Shohei Otani. And that does it for this week in Shohei Otani News. All right, and now it is time for this week's Six Tool Player of the Week. This week's Six Tool Player of the Week is Jackie Bradley Jr. Let me talk about why Jackie Bradley Jr. is a six tool player of the week, because it's not a normal circumstance. It's not a, f a flashy bad flip, something flashy he did. It's not. You know what he did? He made one of the most heads up, coolest plays in center field that I have seen in a long, long time. They're playing the Pirates. They're in Pittsburgh. Ball hit to deep center field deep center field, takes him back, uh, and he starts jogging. Like, he looks up into the stands, starts jogging, and, and looks up like, yep, that ball's out of here. Last second, he looks up, catches it quick, and ends up throwing an absolute rocket to first base, doubling the guy off. The throw was incredible, but the throw isn't what I want to talk about. It's that heads-up play in center field. It's doing those things that nobody thinks about. It's next level type of stuff. Jackie Bradley Jr. is an incredible center fielder, but this is next level stuff. Going back, looking up into the stands so that the runner on first base continues to run, which is exactly what happened. The runner on first base saw him look up into the stands and proceeded to round second base and, and thought the ball was gone. Last second, he looks up, catches it real quick, and throws it to first all in one motion. Throws it to first base on a line in the air and doubles him off at first base. An absolutely incredible heads up play. And he also had a great week at the plate. 
He hit a bomb this week. Jackie Bradley Jr. was struggling uh, to start the year and with his new team. He was struggling at the plate, but he figured it out this week and he's been hitting a lot better this past month. He hit a bomb, hit a bunch of doubles, uh, and he's playing so much better. But look, that's not what makes him this week's six tool player of the week. It's that heads up stuff. And I know most of the time it's bat flips and it's swinging 3-0 and it's, you know, taunting, you know, back and forth. It's all that stuff, but that's not always what Six Tool's about. It can be anything, and you know, it's this is this is really cool, and this is really heads up, and I always like to showcase stuff that people don't often see when they're watching a game. You know, what people do see in that play is, oh, what a great arm to throw him out at first base, but that's not what made this play incredible. It's him deking the runner. This never happens without that deke, and uh, to look up last second, turn and throw it, Absolutely incredible. So that is why Jackie Bradley Jr. is this week's sixth tool player of the week. But look, let's talk about power rankings. It is the first episode of the month, which means only one thing. I'm going to talk about my top five power rankings in all of baseball right now. And we're going to start with number five, and that is the San Diego Padres. The Padres are playing in, in my opinion right now, the best division in baseball. So yes, I understand they're in third place, but they're still like 50 and 37. They have an incredible record. They have Fernando Tatis leading the charge. This team is awesome. Their pitching rotation has been great, and that's without Blake Snell being as good as we know he's capable of being. So the Padres come in at number five. There's a couple teams that just missed the cut in the White Sox at six and the Brewers. But here, let me promise you this. If the Brewers continue to play, as they are and as they have been, I promise you the Brewers are gonna be in the top five really, really soon, because they're playing great baseball. But let's talk about number four. It is the Boston Red Sox. The Red Sox are on a tear, man. They're on an absolute tear. They're leading the AL East. They're just dominating. They end up sweeping the New York Yankees in a big series. Uh, the Not this past weekend, but the weekend before end up sweeping the Yankees, which was a huge series. Look, the Yankees were the favorite to win this division. I truly believed the Red Sox were good, but I, I, do, I did believe the Yankees were gonna win the division. So this was a huge series for both sides. The surprising Red Sox against the Yankees, who were the favorites in the division, uh, who weren't too far behind to begin that series. The Red Sox end up sweeping them, putting a lot of distance between them and the Yankees and end up just going on an absolute tear this uh, this past week. They're playing awesome baseball and that is why they are number four on the power rankings. It's moving on to number three, the Houston Astros. Look, what the Astros are doing, they went on a little stretch there where their offense was historic. They're putting up numbers in bunches. They're first, first in virtually every offensive category. This team is where they are because of their offense. It's plain and simple. The Astros are as good as they are because of their offense. Um, their pitching has come a long way since the beginning of the year. I do believe they need to make something, they need to do something at the deadline. They need to add a pitcher. They have to. Uh, but it's this offense that's winning this team games, and it is incredible. They're putting up numbers at a historic pace on the offensive side, and that is why the Astros are the number three team in my power rankings right now. Number two, the San Francisco Giants. Man, what a story. San Francisco Giants are an awesome story. To, to me, best story in baseball so far from a team perspective. Best story in baseball. They're in the NL West, which has three incredible teams. They're actually still in first place in the NL West, but that gap has gotten a lot closer. Um, you look at this roster and it doesn't jump off the paper to you as, as, oh my God, this team is incredible. But they're doing it right in every facet of the game. And I've been saying this for a while now. This team is real. To start the year, you would say this team has no chance in the NL West. They just don't. A month into the year, it's, uh, this is a fluke. This is a fluke. They're playing really well, but they're not as good as these other teams. Now, give these guys the credit they deserve. This team is very good. This team is going to be there until the end in the NL West, and it's gonna be a three-way dogfight between the three teams at the top of the NL West. But the San Francisco Giants are deserving of everybody's credit because this team is real. 
and they're here to stay. But number one on my power rankings uh, for this week is the Los Angeles Dodgers. Look, they're the Dodgers, man, and I know they've had some ups and downs this year, but they have turned it around. Ever since they got no hit by the Chicago Cubs, they haven't lost. They had a little fire in them. They've been dominating ever since. Look, this roster is the best in baseball. There's, there's no way around that. This roster, on paper, is the best in baseball. Pitching rotation, offense, it can't be beat. And I know they went through some ups and downs. They also had some injuries get in the way. But look, Bellinger's back. This team is back. They're getting healthier. And they're playing incredible, incredible baseball. And uh, look, we, we knew this was the case. We knew the Dodgers were good. For a little while there, they hopped out of first place in the power rankings for a few weeks to a month there. But they're back. And they're right on the heels of the Giants in that division. They swept the Giants the last time they played them. Big series for both sides. Giants could have put some space in between them, but they didn't. The Dodgers caught up big time, and they are number one in the MLB power rankings right now. Before I sign off, cool moment from this past week. One of my favorite moments of the week, Brett Phillips, who, uh, who I'm a friend with, pitched. He pitched in a baseball game this week, but that wasn't the most exciting part of it. It started from the beginning before he actually got the call out to the mound. He's, he's up against the fence, like, looking out like a little kid, like, call me in. Call me in. They finally do call him in to pitch, and he sprints. The bullpen gates open. He sprints from the bullpen to the pitcher's mound. He gets out there. He's doing all these weird stretches. Brett Phillips is one of the best, greatest characters in all of baseball. Best laugh in baseball and an absolute character. This was incredible. He gets up there. Um, and is throwing, it almost looks like he's lifting his leg incorrectly. He's throwing 47 miles an hour. He unleashes one pitch that was 94 miles an hour. He did it one time, threw one pitch 94 miles an hour. Other than that, just threw 47, 45, 47 miles an hour. I uh, was leaning over, pointing at everybody, stretching, balking. He dropped the ball while on the mound. Just an absolutely incredible pitching performance. This was a blowout. The Rays were getting blown out, but he found a way to make this game exciting. And that's what I love talking about, the game of baseball and who's making it more exciting. And Brett Phillips certainly did that in an absolute blowout of a game. He made it entertaining to watch. So I wanted to talk about that. I wanted to talk about Brett Phillips. But let's not forget, 94 miles an hour. It's in there. It's in there. Pretty cool to see. But that does it for this week's episode of Flippin' Bats. Thank you guys for listening. Make sure you're checking out all the social channels we have, Twitter, Instagram. It comes out via YouTube. Um, and then, of course, follow, subscribe, and follow on wherever you listen to your podcast. Uh, Apple, Spotify, Google, wherever that may be. So make sure you're hitting that subscribe button, rating five stars, leaving a comment, all that good stuff. And thank you guys so much for listening. Next time you hear from us, we'll be at the All-Star Game. So we'll be live from Denver next time we see you. Thanks for listening. Bye. It's a blowout. He swings and it's a high fly ball, deep center field, it is gone, home run, and a huge bat flip to celebrate. Thanks for watching. If you love flipping bats, swinging 3-0, or just talking ball, join us. Call us at 213-537-9339 with your questions. We have a weekly guest and we have a lot of fun, so hit that subscribe button.